time. Namaste, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, Satsang this morning. It is always uh, wonderful to be together with uh, all of you. So last uh, uh, Satsang, we were discussing the fifth uh, verse of uh, Nirvana Shatakam. And so this is where I will begin and continue with uh, today. Name Mrityu Shankha Name Jati Bhedaha Pita Naiva Me Naiva Mata Na Janma Nabandhur Namitram Gurur Naiva Shishyaha Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. So we discussed uh, the first line Name Mrityu Shankha. Shankha, as I said, means anxiety, it means worry, it means uh, fear. The anxiety that with mrityu, with death, I revert back to some uh, state of non-being or non-existence. My existence comes to an end. But here uh, the teacher Sri Shankara is reminding us, name mrityu shanka that we should not have this fear, this anxiety, because Chidananda Atma does not die in Amrityu. Why? Because na janma. It is not born, therefore it does not uh, die. As we, have, as we learn from Bhagavad Gita, jartasya hi dhruvo mrityu. That which is born, jartasya hi, Dhruvo Mrityu. That is certain for that which is born, but not for that which is not born. So Chidananda Atma is na janma, has no birth, and therefore Chidananda has no uh, death. Birth and death are events occurring in, in time. This is why we can recall time of death, time of birth, but Chidananda Atma has no birth, therefore no uh, death. This is a great teaching we see in all of our texts. Many of you are familiar with Bhagavad Gita. There are so many beautiful verses, especially in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that speaks to this truth. Najayate, viyate, vakada, chitta, from the second chapter. It is not at any time born, nor does it uh, at any time die. Nainam chindanti shastrani. It is not cut by any weapons. Nainam dahati pavakaha, nor burnt by fire. Na chainam cleared ayantyapu, nor drowned in waters. Na soshayati marutaha, nor dried or dehydrated by the wind. Atma, as we have been learning, is the very witness, the awareness by which we witness time and, and change. It is, it exists in all three periods of time. Kalatraye apitishtati. Kalatraye, past, present, future, tishtati. It, it stands, it, it is. You know, think of this as an example. I don't know how many of you have had this experience. I've certainly had this experience traveling by train in India and in other parts of the world. But if you are traveling in a, in a train and on the tracks parallel to your train, there is another train moving at the same speed. Both trains are traveling at the same speed. You have a sense that there is no movement. <laughs> you think that you are standstill when there is a parallel train uh, moving at the same speed. I'm sure many of you will remember this. But if your train is at a stop, at a standstill, of course, you see the, the next train passing by. So Atma is like the train that is at standstill, the one, the train that does, does not move, and because of which we can witness change. Because it is changeless, we are aware of change. It is like the motionless train because of which you see the moving uh, trains, because Atma itself does not um, move. It is, as we say, 
the unchanging witness of change, the unchanging light, the unchanging light by which we witness and experience all change itself free from change. So Name Mrityu Shanka Name Jati Bheda. We talk, uh, this is where we stopped uh, with our class last time. Jati, as I said, comes from the Sanskrit jata, which means birth, that which is produced. So from jata, we have jati. And jati refers to any identity that a person might have on the basis of his or her birth. In specifically with regard to the you know, ancient tradition of India, jati is used sometimes uh, synonymously for the four varnas, you know, brahmanas, kshatriyas, vaishyas, and, uh, and shudras. But here, uh, the teacher is reminding us that art machidananda atma, which has no birth, not janma, does not have any intrinsic identity based on birth. And as I said last day, there is no uh, brahmana, brahmana atma, no kshatriya atma, no vaishya atma, no shudra atma, no untouchable uh, atma. Race also, I, I want to add, race also is a jati bhedaha. It is a division of human beings, also based on, on birth and, and based on color. So if we negate uh, uh, birth-based identity, divisions based on birth, dividing people into categories of superiority and inferiority based on birth, we also have to apply this to uh, race. Race is a sort of jati uh, classification. So Chidananda Atma, is one and the same in all beings. And we should not, never should we classify human beings into categories of greater and lesser worth, regarding some as inferior to others or more pure than others. Beda is division, Beda is classification on the premise that some have higher worth than others. This is a, a, a teaching that is as relevant today for us as it was, you know, in the time of uh, Shanghai. Unfortunately, very sadly, in so many parts of our world, we are still struggling with these uh, classifications. Whatever might be the criteria for the classifications, there still exist so many unjust and oppressive classifications of human beings based on the fact that they are different from us either on color of skin or by some circumstances of birth. This teaching here is an antidote to those kinds of classifications. And uh, as we have spoken last day, inviting us to treat all human beings with equal dignity and with equal value. Pita naiva, me naiva. The second line I will start from uh, now. Pita naiva, me naiva, mata na janma, na bandhur na mitram, gurur naiva shishya, chidananda rupa shivoham shivoham. Pita naiva, I am without father, without mother, naiva mata, na bandhur, relations, Mitram, friends. Gurur Naiva, I have no teacher. No, am I a teacher? Gurur Naiva Shishya, Chidananda Rupa, Shivoham, Shivoham. Now, verses like these have to be very carefully understood. They are very easy to misunderstand if one is not, if one does not teach very, very carefully. So, you know, one can just proclaim, well, this is what the Vedanta teach, tradition teaches me. I have no mother, I have no father, I have no teacher, I have no relatives, I have no, no friends. It's, it comes across as a very negative um, teaching if it is not properly understood and if it is read at a very superficial level. So I'm going to spend some time with this 
with this line because I think it is uh, very important. And, and equally, one might come away from the, with the understanding that, uh, that in order to understand this teaching, I have to give up all of my relationships in the world, whatever these relationships might be. So we have to understand such teachings very, very carefully. And this is what we will do this morning. So first is, of course, <laughs> I have a father. Whether my father is alive or not, I do have a father. Of course, I have a mother. Of course, if I have brothers and I have sisters, I have siblings. If I am a teacher, of course, I have students. And if I have learned, of course, I have a, a teacher. These are all very important relationships in life. And we should treat all of these relationships with great respect and value. The same tradition that we all come from, many of you are familiar, teaches us Matru Devo Bhava, Pitru Devo Bhava, Acharya Devo Bhava, Atiti Devo Bhava. May you become one for whom the mother is treated with respect. May you become, may you be a person for whom the father is treated with respect. May you be one for whom the teacher is treated with respect. May you be one for whom the stranger, Atiti, is treated with, with respect. This is a, a very great teaching of the of a Taitriya Upanishad. So we would be understanding uh, wrongly if we come away with the conclusion that the Nirvana Shatakam is teaching that these relationships are not important and they ought to be treated lightly and dismissed. Please don't draw that uh, conclusion. What, what is the significance of the teacher saying, uh, speaking these words, Pita naiva, me naiva, mata na janma. For Chidananda, as we have learned, which is never born. So here you will, you will see also, he uses the expression na janma. Pita naiva, me naiva, mata na janma. He repeats this, na janma, for Chidananda, atma, which has no birth, na janma, janma means birth. There is no father, there is no mother, there are no siblings, there is no teacher, there is no disciple. These are all relationships that come through birth and after birth. These are relationships, very important relationships that come with janma, come through birth and which we cultivate after birth, like we develop friendships, we become students, we become teachers, teachers and learners, all post birth or after birth. And through birth, we come into this world through our, through parents, through our fathers and mothers, Pita, Mata. So uh, Shankara's purpose here is not to deny the reality of these relationships or the value of these relationships, but through these relationships to speak of, to teach us something about Chidananda Atma, who we are, which is free from birth and death, and which is, as we're learning, the same in all beings. He's using these relationships to teach us something about ourselves Chidananda Atma, which is Najanma, never uh, born. There is another important point here that must be emphasized. So think with me for a few moments. You, if you are <laughs> father, I, you know, we are fathers to our children. That's an important, that's one relationship. I'm a father to my children. You are a father to your, ch to your children. Your wife, my wife is a mother to our children. We are sons or we are daughters to our parents. Our parents are sons and daughters to their, to their uh, parents. To my students, I am a teacher. To my teacher, I am his 
student, I am his shishya, his disciple, you know, you can add relationships, employer, employee, and so forth. And as I said, repeating myself, these are important and they should be uh, honored. Now, when we understand ourselves or we think ourselves, think of ourselves, these relationships, as valuable and as important as they are, are usually where we stop in our self understanding. What the teacher is pointing out here, not, not discarding these relationships, is the point that these relationships, however, do not tell us everything about ourselves. We are fathers, we are mothers, we are sons, we are daughters, we are teachers, we are students, we are employers, we are employees, but there is something more. Defining ourselves through these relationships is important, but it is not complete. It is not everything about who we, who we are. And these roles, father, mother, son, daughter, grandfather, grandmother. These roles differ, of course, depending on the relationships that are present before us at any particular point in time. As the relationships change, the roles change. So when I am, if, when I am with one of my friends, then the friend person comes into being. I'm a friend with my friend, right? So I have a a person, a whole uh, system, a series of values that define me as a friend. When I'm with my friends, those are the values that come alive. That's the role that becomes uh, prominent. When I enter into the classroom, I am no longer, but the friend is not prominent, but the teacher is prominent. <laughs> now I, I'm in the role of a teacher. So I change from friend to teacher, but I can be a friendly teacher also. <laughs> and, uh, when I'm with my children, then of course, you know, I am a father. When I'm with my grandchild, I am a grandfather. I am a cousin with my cousins. I am a nephew with my, with my uncle. So, you know, during a particular day, depending on what my interactions are, my roles change. And that's fine. And that, that, that is as it, as, it, uh, uh, as, it, as it should be. We should not be confused about those, those um, those uh, roles with, in, in my relationship with my wife, I'm not a father. <laughs> to, I, am a, I am a husband, I'm not a father to my, uh, to my friends. So I should keep my roles distinct as, as well. So some of, these, some of these roles come through birth, like son, daughter, you know, father, child, and so on. And some, as we say, are cultivated in the process of growing up, like, friend, teacher, uh, student, etc. So relationships and roles change. They vary. They change in the course of a, of a day, a week, a month. We have many beautiful um, roles that we, we uh, through which we relate to other human beings. But one truth about you about me, about all beings does not change. I am indeed a father in relation to my sons and my daughter, but I am Chidananda Atma. I am, the father is Chidananda. I am a son in relation to my parents, but the son is Chidananda. I'm a teacher. When I'm a, when I am a teacher to my students, when I enter my classroom, I'm no longer a son. But the teacher is Chidananda. And when I'm when I'm with my son, I'm not the teacher, but the father is Chidananda. The husband is Chidananda. The teacher is Chidananda. The student is Chidananda. The employer is Chidananda. The employee is Chidananda. This is this is the identity that does not vary with the changing of relationships. This is the constant 
unchanging because as we have just seen, Chidananda does not change. Roles change in life depending on relationships, but Chidananda does not change. So how should I understand myself? As Chidananda, father is Chidananda, son is Chidananda, teacher is Chidananda, student is Chidananda. All roles take on new meaning when we know ourselves to be Chidananda. Knowing oneself to be Chidananda enriches, <laughs> enriches one's role as teacher, as student, as mother, as father, as grandfather, as grandmother, as, as friend. See, I can be a father to my children, but I'm not my children's mother. My wife is their mother, but she's not their, their father. If I am one, I am not the other. But Chidananda can be both, can be mother. In fact, is mother, is father, is grandfather, is brother, is sister. All mothers are Chidananda, all fathers are Chidananda. All children, all teachers, all students are Chidananda. So knowing myself as Chidananda, transforms all of these roles. I would say enriches, deepens, adds value to all of these roles. And also, so it adds value to myself in these roles, but when I see the other also, when I see, as I said last day, I see my student as Chidananda, my son as Chidananda, my wife as Chidananda, my friend as Chidananda, I also, these relationships also gain new value. So I see myself and the other as Chidananda and that seeing deepens and riches, adds depth and meaning to these relationships. And we, we have, we're already seeing how that understanding can be transformative. We just, at the beginning of this verse, just to give you an example, Name Jati Bheda. Chidananda is free from these divisions based on birth. So the, if, if I understand this, what it means that in relationships, I don't judge people to be inferior or to be superior on the basis of birth. I bring this vision to my relationships now. We saw earlier, Namatsariya Bhava. Chidananda is free of jealousy. Matsariya. Name Dvesha Ragao, Name Lobha Mohao, Madho Naiva Me Naiva Matsariya Bhava. I don't, I am free from envy in my relationships. I can delight in the success of others. I can rejoice in the success of others, I can identify with them in their suffering as well. I am free from nalobha, I am free from greed also. So understanding, think of the ways in which understanding oneself as Chidananda Atma makes a difference in how one fulfills one's roles in life, in family, father, mother, in work, you know, teacher, student, doctor, patient, whatever the, uh, whatever your, your profession, and also in all of our social relationships. How is, how this understanding is meaningful, is transformative, how, what more, it's a, what more it brings, what more this self-understanding brings to our relationship that we will not have if we lacked Chidananda Atma, I am Aham Chidananda Atma. This is the this is the point that I want to, to emphasize. So I am all of these relationships that, that uh, Shankara describes here, but I am more than the sum total of all of these relationships. We don't understand everything about a human being if we only define the human being on the basis of social relationships or even on the basis of birth relationships. There is something, there is something more. 
there is something more. Every human being carries with him or her the sacred, the sacred, the Chidananda. And if we don't see that, we're missing what our tradition regards as the most important thing about the human being. So, I do not have to give up these roles. I do not have to give up my roles as parent, as father, as mother, as son, as daughter, as teacher, as student, any, think of any role in order to know that I am Chidananda. I don't have to renounce these roles. I don't have to cease being father, mother, parent, grandparent, in order to know that I am Chidananda. Knowing this does not require that I abandon these, these roles or I don't fulfill them. I don't become the best mother that I can be, the best grandmother that I can be, the best friend that I can be. I don't have to give up these roles to know that I am Chidananda. What I am saying is I should know that I am Chidananda and I should enjoy all of these roles. These roles take on new meaning. They can be, they become also joy-filled roles. You know, they become roles in which I am expressing <laughs> myself. I'm expressing who I am, Chidananda. Think of it. A clay pot, since I started off with some of these examples, a clay pot does not have to cease being a clay pot to know that it's clay. <laughs> If I say, you know, the only way you can know that you are a clay pot is that you have to be broken into bits. No, can be a clay pot and know that I am clay. <laughs> clay is my being, I'm nothing but, but clay. I am clay in this particular form. And the other example I use, you know, with wave and water, a wave doesn't have to cease to be a wave to know I am water. It can know I am water in its own uniqueness, its own unique form as a wave, it does not have to deny its waveness or its spotness in order to know Chidananda Rupa. There is beauty, <laughs> there is beauty in every form. There is beauty in every form. There is beauty in the difference of every form. There is beauty in the uniqueness of every human being. There is no one like you, there is no one like me in this universe. This universe is, is, is a universe in which you know, in the in in our uh, in the Upanishads, the, the 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 many of the Upanishads starts start off with a beautiful uh, wish on the part of Chidananda, may I become many, may I become many, may I multiply myself. So kamayata bahusyam prajayeti, may I multiply myself, may I become many. And so the many <laughs> is a is a is a consequence of the intentional self-multiplication of the many. And so we must honor every one of these, of the many. <laughs> every one of the many is different. And every one of the many is precious because every one of the many has come from the one. <laughs> every form is unique. Every form is, is valuable. There is no redundant form in the universe. If you are here in the universe, you are you're meant to be. <laughs> you are also uh, one of the many multiplications of 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 Chidananda Atma. One should one should um, one should know that. So one doesn't have to to abandon one's roles to know Chidananda. Enter into the roles with this with this with this knowledge with this uh, wisdom. This is how we should uh, understand uh, these uh, verses. And then uh, the, the final verse, verse six, aham nirvikalpo nirakara rupa vibhur vyapya sarvatra sarvendriyanam nacha sang sadame samatvam na muktir na bandha chidananda rupa shivoham shivoham. Beautiful conclusion, uh, Shankara 
gives sort of brings the the composition to an exquisite end with uh, with the final uh, voice. So let us start with uh, nirakara. Aham nirakara rupah. Aham nirakara rupah. So nir means, of course, without, without akara. Nirakara. Akara means form. Akara is that which has form, shape, form. So uh, nir akara means uh, having no form, without, without form. Just think about it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the meaning speaks uh, for itself. Form is an attribute of uh, a limited object. So if I hold uh, this uh, clay uh, cup in my hand, you can see the form. Right? You see the form because it's, it's existing within space. It has a defined form. It's a finite object. It has akara. <laughs> it is an object with akara, with form, or, or with, uh, with shape. You can see its definitions within, within, within space. But as we have uh, been learning, Chirananda is not an object in space, like, like the clay pot. It is not an object in space. If it was an object in space, naturally it would be limited. It, there would be a point where it begins here and a point where it ends, right? We can see its contours. We can see, it begin, if we can see it be, its beginning and we can see its end and therefore it will be finite, it would not be uh, uh, limitless. Chirananda has no, I can say, you know, this, this uh, clay pot, where is it now? It is in my home and I can give you my geographical location and say, here alone it is. <laughs> it is here in Apple Valley, Minnesota. This is its address. Uh, Chirananda does not have an address <laughs> because its address is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> its address is its address is everywhere because it's not an object in space. It has no geographical address. We can't we can't uh, use the United States Post Office to send a mail to Chidananda. It is it is as we say it is sarva It is it is everywhere. It is all pervasive, but that's because it's nirakara. It has no form. Only that which is without form can be. Sarvagataha can be all pervasive. And this is why in our, in our sacred text, uh, one of the analogies that is used for Chidananda Atma is uh, Akasha, space, which is, which is also regarded as a Sarvagataha, which is all pervasive. But uh, of course, we all need to understand that space and everything that exists in space exists in Chidananda. <laughs> Space and everything in space, space and time, and all objects in space and time exist in uh, Chidananda. Chidananda is nirakara, it is without uh, form. And there's another point here. Because it is without form of its own, it is nirakara. It can be in any form. If it had a very specific form, it could not be in all forms. Again, coming back to the analogy of clay and, and objects made of clay, which also is a limited analogy because it's a finite object. So every analogy will break down at some point in, in time if you press it very far and, and, and take it to its limits. But if I ask you, you know, what is the form of clay? You can't really tell me. You'll say, well, it depends on what you make out of the clay, what you shape, it gets its form from the particular shape, but clay itself can be molded into any form because clay itself has no intrinsic um, form. In a sim similar way, 
uh, Chidananda Atma, because it is uh, Nirakara, it can assume uh, any, any form. Chidananda, with, as I said before, you know, Chidananda with wings is the bird. Chidananda with branches is the, is the tree and, and so on and so forth. So, aham nirvikara rupaha. Rupa is an interesting Sanskrit uh, expression that Shankara uses here, aham nirvikara rupaha. Rupa is, uh, generally means form, but here rupa is not finite form. Rupa here is really what we will say in Sanskrit is swarupa, swarupa means nirakara without form or formlessness is the swarupa, is the very nature of chidananda. Nirakara is chidananda swarupa. Because if we don't understand rupa here as swarupa, then we will <laughs> we'll translate the verse and we'll understand it to mean that I am in the form of the formless <laughs> chidananda. It becomes a... Um, a contradictory statement. I am in the form of the formless <laughs> because the formless means without form. So I can't be in the form of the formless. <laughs> so we, that's why I'm saying we have to understand the word rupa here to mean uh, swarupa, intrinsic um, nature. You know, the opposite of nirakara, which is without form, nirakara is sakara. Sa means wit. So sa akara or sa sakara is wit form. And nirakara is nirakara is without without form. Sometimes you know <laughs> there's this debate and some of us will some people will say oh, I believe in a divine being who is nirakara. And then there are those who will say, no, 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 I believe in the divine being who is sakara, who is without, without form. But nirakara without form and sakara with form are not opposed. They don't exclude each other. These are not opposites, exclusive opposites. Because the nirakara can be in any sakara. In fact, nirakara, the one who is without form, is in every form, <laughs> sakara. So they, are not, they don't exclude each other. Once we understand that the, the formless one is in all form, nirakara is in all sakaras. In fact, every sakara is nirakara sakara. Every form is chidananda's form. Every form is the formless, the formless one's form because <laughs> the formless is present in all in all forms. It's very, it's not, we should not think of these as excluding. You know, I, 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 I worship a God with form and others worship a God without form. In a similar way, I don't think, I mean, there's no time to explore these, but two words also that are often treated as opposites, but I don't understand them as opposites are nirguna and saguna, with qualities and without qualities. And you know, we say, we, some, of, some will say, no, my divine being is nirguna, others will say my divine being is saguna, but I don't think these are, again, these are opposites. So aham nirvikalpo nirakara rupaha. Nirvikalpa, aham nirvikalpa. So we've seen nirakara. Now uh, the next word that he uses here is nirvikalpa. So we have uh, we've not encountered this word before in the nirvana shatkam, but uh, we have encountered the meaning. Again, uh, you see the same Sanskrit uh, construction, nir means without. So previously we saw nir, nirakara, nirakara, without, without form. Now we see nirvikalpa. So nir without, vikalpa means uh, change or movement, change or movement, without change. So, all changes, uh, all movements occur in Chidananda. Nothing is apart from or away from Chidananda. All changes are occurring. All vikalpas, all changes, vikalpa means change or movement. All changes, all movements occur only within 
the Chidananda, which, but with Chidananda itself is nirvikalpa, is free from change because it is, uh, it is limitless. Where can it move? <laughs> Where can it go? <laughs> there is no movement for Chidananda. Movement is only for a limited object. I can get up from where I'm sitting here and I can go to another room because I'm not in that, I'm not in that room. But Chidananda is, trans, he's, as we've seen, Sarvagata, so there's no vikalpa for Chidananda. There is no, there is no movement from one place uh, to another. Chidananda is that in which space itself is. Change and movement are only attributes of finite forms, but not for uh, Chidananda. It never ceases to be what it what it is. It doesn't change its nature. Therefore, it is free from it is free from uh, change. That's how we should understand aham nirvikalpa. Uh, think again of the example of the train and the, the motion of the trains that I I, uh, I gave you earlier. Free from movement. Free from free from change. Aham nirvikalpo. Nirakara Rupa Vibhur Vyapya Sarvatra Sarvendriyanam Sadame Samatvam Namuktir Nameya Namuktir Nabandha Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham Vibhur Vyapya Sarvatra Sarvendriyanam Vibhu Vibhu Vyapyaha almost identical in meaning. Vibhu is one of the names we use for the divine. Vibhu means the one who is present in everything is called Vibhu. Vibhu means Vyapaka, to be all pervasive, which is, as I said, is only possible for that which is without form. Only a formless reality can be said to be Vibhu or Sarvatra. So Vibhu Vyapya Sarvatra Sarve Indriyanam. Indriyanam means here the sense organ, Sarve, or all sense organ. So I am, I am everywhere. Aham Vibhuhu, Aham Vyapaha, Aham Sarvatra. I am everywhere in everything that is experienced by the senses. Sarve Indriyanam. Think of it. In every sound that you hear, Chidananda Atma is there. There are five sense organs and there are five objects. So Sarve Indriyanam would be all form, all, all things that you see, all things that you hear, all things that you, you taste, all things that you touch, all objects of, of smell. In fact, he's using the expression Sarve Indriyanam here to speak about the universe in its, uh, its, in its entirety, experienced through the five senses. So everything that is, the five senses and everything that one experiences through the five senses, Chidananda Atma is, Vibhuhu is vyapa, is, is present, pervades, exists in. Nothing is away from it, nothing is apart from it. It is in everything, and everything is uh, in, in Chidananda Atma. Being all pervasive, it is present in everything. Sadame Samatvam Namuktihi Nabandha. Chidananda Rupa, Shivoham, Shivoham. Dame Samatvam. Samatvam is a very beautiful <laughs> Sanskrit word. You know, here he uses, interestingly, he uses the word Samatvam for, for the, to describe the nature of Chidananda, which is Samatvam is also used for peace. Samatvam, that which is always at peace. Always at peace is called Samatvam. In, in Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna uses the word Samatvam, I believe, once. Uh, and then he says there, you know, Samatvam Yoga Uchyate. Samatvam Yoga Uchyate. That Samatvam is the essence of yoga. Yoga is peace. Yoga is stillness. Samatvam Yoga Uchite. So here, Shankara says, Chidananda Atma is stillness. It is Shanti. It is, it is peace. 
So when we are in a state of peace, we are really uh, with ourselves, with our true, with our true selves. Samatvam, we are samatvam, ourselves, intrinsic, intrinsic um, netya. Namuktihi Nabanda is a very beautiful line to end um, this uh, composition. I will mention it briefly and then discuss it in some more detail um, when we have our final class on uh, Nirvana Shatkam, which is on the 15th uh, of this uh, month. But let me, uh, before discussing, let me tell you a story and I'll stop here with, with the story. See, he says here, na muktihi na bandha. I was never, I am not free, <laughs> nor am I bound. I am neither free nor bound. Bandha means to be bound. Muktihi means to be free. Sada me samatvam, I am always the same at peace. I was not bound and I am not free. <laughs> Sadame samatvam na mukti na bandha. How can you say na mukti or na moksha when we say moksha is your highest goal? It is what we all is what we all want. And then now, how can Shankara say na mukti na bandha? I am not free and I am not I am not um, bound. So I will just tell you a story and then um, we'll we'll end today. This is sorry, my guru used to say, teach, uh, I heard my guru telling a story when I was a student. So he told a story about a guru who had a, an ashram in the ancient times. And these uh, ashramas were self-sufficient institutions. Uh, in other words, uh, they grew their own food and they produce their own milk and, uh, and all the yogurt and all that they needed for uh, maintaining the, the ashram. So the uh, students were given different assignments in the ashram to maintain its sustainability. So there was one student who was in charge of the ashram's cows. So he, it was his responsibility to take the cows out on mornings for grazing and then bring the cows back into the cow, uh, into the cow pen, into the barn uh, on evenings so that they uh, would, would stay there. But whenever he, when the cows were brought back uh, into the cow shed or the cow pen or the barn, whichever word you prefer, uh, he would tie them because they didn't want the cows to wander uh, into the forest without supervision because of wild animals. So one, one evening, this student brought the cows back into the cow shed, but then he realized that he lost the ropes to tie the cows. He couldn't find the ropes that he would use to tie the cows at night. So he ran to the guru and said, you know, Guruji, uh, I don't know what I did with the ropes. The ropes that I used to tie the cows, I've lost the ropes. I can't find them. I've searched everywhere for these um, ropes, but I can't find the ropes. What should we do? Because it's dangerous to leave the cows uh, untied for the night. We may lose our, our herd. So the guru said to him, okay, I understand that you lost uh, the rope. But here is what I am going to suggest to you. You go back to the cow shed and uh, you should go to each cow and do exactly what you would do as if you were tying the cow. You know, go through all the motions, you know, that you would perform as you would have done if you had the ropes in your hand. So he didn't, wasn't quite convinced, but the, he didn't quite understand you know, what the guru was asking for him, but it's this guru after all. And he, you don't, you know, he wouldn't, didn't want to question him. He thought maybe the guru, I will go there and my guru will recite some sacred mantra 
and the cows will not leave the, the cow shed. He was worried because if the cow left, it was his responsibility, but he trusted his guru and was not, didn't want to uh, disobey his guru. So reluctantly, trusting his guru, he went to the cow shed and um, went through with each cow, he went through the motions of putting the rope around uh, the cow's uh, neck and tying it to the cow, to the peg that he had for each of the cows. And then came back and told the guru what he had done. The guru uh, said, very good. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that you, you did what you did. Next morning, he got up early because he's supposed to take the cows now to pasture. He was quite thought, well, I, maybe all the cows have gone. <laughs> I, there are no cows there. He was, wor he was worried. So he went um, to the cow shed and he saw all of the cows there. They were sitting in the cow shed. So he went to, to, the, to the first cow and, you know, as he would do, he'll, he'll pat the cow and the cow would get up, each one would get up and, and follow him um, to the pasture. So he, he went, uh, you know, patted each cow, the, each cow stood up and, you know, he said, let's go, chalo. And normally they would follow him, but no cow moved. No cow moved. They all stood there. They didn't move. So what to do? <laughs> so he runs back to his guru and says, you know, we've got a problem. That now the cows, the cows don't want to go to the pasture and they are not tied. They don't want to go to the pasture. I don't know what to do. You know, if you recited a mantra that kept them in the cow shed, now please recite the mantra to release them. <laughs> to release them. So um, the guru, uh, guru said, you know, uh, did you untie the cows? He said, but Guruji, how can I untie them? I didn't, I didn't tie them in the first place. He says, no, but you did. Remember I told you to go and, you know, do, go through all the motions of, of tying the cows. So please go now and untie each one of the cows. So he went <laughs> back to the cow shed, went to each cow and did the exact motions of loosening the rope that he would have done if he was actually, if he actually had, had the ropes. And when he did that and he gave them the instructions, the cows followed him. They all went with him. They became free in a sense. They were free and they moved into the, into the pasture. So my guru used to give that, to tell that story to make the, explain, na muktir na bandha. That bandha, to be bound, is to have a certain belief in one's mind. You know, it is a vidya. It's a certain belief. Chidananda Atma is Samatvam. It is always free. It is only bound because we, we think it is other than it is. <laughs> it is not in actuality. It is not in reality bound. Whatever we think about Chidananda doesn't really change the nature of Chidananda. Both bondage, bandha, and mukti are conditions of the mind. They are mental conditions, like the rope, <laughs> that is the, the illusory rope that was used to bind the cows and the illusory untying that, that freed the, the, the cows. Chidananda is samatvam. Na mukti na bandha. But we are bound because we are subject to avidya and we are released when ignorance is dispelled when ignorance is removed by the teaching of the of the guru so i will <laughs> stop with my guru my guru's uh, beautiful story and uh, we will we will continue uh, from there for our last class uh, on in two weeks time after uh, dr sani does 
the Bhaja Govindam uh, next next Sunday. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, next class, you know, I'll finish up and maybe I'll make some um, summary uh, statements, some summary insights about Chidan and the Atma. Maybe we can also have some conversation. I would love to hear from you and to know what what insights from this poem, what teachings from the great uh, Shankara's Nirvana Shatakam really went home for you, really uh, reached you? What, what will you take from this great uh, teaching of uh, Nirvana Shatakam? <laughs>